At room temperature, ammonia is a colorless gas with a pungent odor. Ammonia is a really simple nitrogen-containing molecule, and it's used to make a huge variety of things like fertilizers, pharmaceuticals, and cleaning products. However, the majority of ammonia, in one way or another, is actually used for fertilization. In chemistry, ammonia has quite a few different uses, and today we're going to explore a couple. In the first part, we'll dissolve a little bit of the ammonia gas in water to make an aqueous basic solution. And in the second part, we'll actually dry the ammonia gas and condense it in its liquid form to form anhydrous ammonia. This anhydrous, liquid, and water-free form of ammonia has quite a few interesting properties, and we'll explore these in the video. To generate the ammonia, we use sodium hydroxide and an ammonium-based salt. The calcium oxide that's balanced on top of the two bottles is going to be used to dry the ammonia gas. The ammonia is basic, so this doesn't leave us with a lot of drying agents to use because a lot of them are actually slightly acidic. If it's slightly acidic, it'll probably react with the ammonia, which won't really make for a good drying agent. The two most easily available drying agents for ammonia gas is going to be either calcium oxide or sodium hydroxide. I chose to use calcium oxide because when you buy it, it's easy to get finely powdered, whereas sodium hydroxide isn't. When the drying agent is a powder, it has more surface area and can dry the ammonia gas better. I should note that there are a few different ways to generate ammonia gas, and this is just one way. The other two ways are mixing urea and a base, or by simply boiling an ammonium hydroxide solution. Anyway, enough with the theory, and now we can get started making our ammonia gas. So this is what the overall setup looks like. We have a three-necked round bottom flask that actually goes out of the screen on the bottom, but in the middle it's connected to an addition funnel, and on the right it's connected to a condenser. For this first run, I'm not going to dry the ammonia gas, because I'm actually going to pump it into water so we can generate some ammonium hydroxide. The reaction can get pretty hot and produce a lot of water vapor, but here the condenser probably isn't really needed because if we're making ammonium hydroxide, we're just putting it back into water anyway. It will be needed later though when we generate the anhydrous ammonia. The addition funnel is just going to be filled with water and it's going to be dripped onto the salts inside the reaction flask to get things going. It should also be noted that all of the joints are sealed with a little bit of grease to make sure that the ammonia doesn't leak out into the lab space. The vacuum adapter is open and I use a very sophisticated technique using tape to block it. So to our reaction flask, I first add 88 grams of sodium hydroxide. This is an excess of about 10% to account for the about 10% water content in commercial sodium hydroxide. Then on top of the sodium hydroxide, I added 107 grams of ammonium chloride. You can really use any ammonium-based salt, and I used ammonium chloride because I had it on hand. The reaction that we hope to be carrying out is shown above. The ammonium chloride should react with the sodium hydroxide to form sodium chloride, ammonia gas, and water. I then just very sloppily mix around the salts using a spatula. In theory, the salts should have been mixed before being added to the reaction flask, but you should be aware that when they're mixed, even if they're dry, they will start to produce ammonia gas. When I was satisfied with my mixing, the spatula was removed and the flask was recapped. Then to the addition funnel, I put in an arbitrary amount of water. The water here just serves to dissolve the salts and get the reaction going, so the amount isn't super important. You don't even really need an addition funnel, you could just take off a stopper, pour some water in, and put a stopper back on. So then to start catching some of the ammonia gas, we fill the graduated cylinder with some water and put the tube inside. At this point, I haven't added any water to the reaction, so you can see that it does produce quite a bit of gas even when mixed dry. As the concentration of ammonia in the water increases, the solution will get hotter. After a little while, our ammonium hydroxide solution is removed from the generator, and I add a little bit to a beaker. Using some universal pH strips, we can test the pH and we can see that it's mildly basic. Ammonia is a weak base, so it doesn't ionize super well in water. So especially when it's a little bit dilute like the solution we have, the pH isn't going to be super high. 
We can then use the density of the solution to find out what the concentration is. So we weigh out 10 milliliters of the solution and we find that it weighs 9.52 grams. When we divide 9.52 grams over 10 milliliters, we get that the density is about 0.95 grams a milliliter. We can then go online and find a chart that relates the density with the concentration. And when I do this, we find out that the solution has a concentration of about 12%. Commercially available ammonium hydroxide is at about 28%, so we're about halfway there. To get it more concentrated, we could have just let more ammonia bubble through it. However, I already have concentrated ammonium hydroxide, so I wasn't too interested in doing this, but I was, however, pretty eager to start generating some anhydrous ammonia. So that is exactly what we're going to do now. The first thing we need to do is prepare something very cold to collect the ammonia in. To do this, I decided to submerge a test tube in a dry ice acetone bath. Dry ice has a temperature of about negative 78 degrees Celsius, and ammonia will start to condense at around negative 33. As I mentioned before, the previous setup was missing the drying tube. A Vigoro column, which is loosely packed with calcium oxide, is used as our drying tube and is connected to the setup. The ammonia gas tube is then placed inside the test tube. It should be noted that between this run and the previous run, the tube was thoroughly dried. The majority of the water vapor should be stopped by the condenser column, and the rest should be taken up by the calcium oxide. And then hopefully, into the test tube, we should be pumping nearly in hydrous ammonia. At this point, still no water was added to the generator, but we can still see some of the liquid ammonia condensing on the inside of the test tube. However, this rate of condensation is pretty slow and we're going to want to speed things up. To do this, we add some water to our reaction flask. You can see that after adding just a little bit of water, steam starts to come off. By adjusting the drip rate, we can somewhat control the rate that ammonia is produced. At this angle, it's easier to see that when the water is dripped in, it quickly starts to bubble. This isn't actually water boiling, but ammonia gas being released. So now when we check on our collecting flask, we can see that it's collected a lot more liquid ammonia and the rate is much faster. I kept collecting until I felt it was arbitrarily too much and then I decanted it into another container. The container that I chose to decant it into was a graduated cylinder which was also submerged in a dry ice bath. To make sure that it stayed in hydrous while it was chilling, I covered the top with parafilm or saran wrap. As more and more water is added, soon the mixture in the reaction flask will become pretty liquefied. When this happens and the rate of ammonia generation decreases, we're going to have to start heating the flask a little bit. Oddly enough, the solubility of pretty much all gases decreases in water as the temperature increases. So by increasing the temperature, we can push out as much of the ammonia as possible. Before we do this though, I used the spatula and I broke up the hard chunks at the bottom of the flask. Because we started with a dry mixture, it's pretty easy for it to solidify and become a hard chunk. With a little bit of heat, a lot more ammonia starts to be expelled. I keep collecting the ammonia and transferring it to the grad cylinder, and I stop when it seems like no more is condensing. In the reaction flask, it'll still be boiling, but it's pretty much just water vapor at this point. So our generator is pretty much done now, and we can stop heating it. So when we're finally done, I take the grad cylinder out of the dry ice acetone bath, and I see we've collected about 30 milliliters of anhydrous ammonia. During this whole experiment, a lot of water condensed and froze on the beaker, and it generated quite a bit of snow. Anyway, now to play with the liquid ammonia, we add a little bit to a test tube that's cooled in a dry ice bath. The ammonia is taken out of the dry ice bath and we add a little bit of lithium to it. The ammonia is much more dense than the lithium, so the lithium will float on the surface. As the lithium dissolves in the ammonia, it produces a very nice blue color. The blue color is actually free electrons dissolved in the ammonia.
Unfortunately, I didn't plan super well, and I used a black background instead of a white one. You can still see the blue color, but it's not as evident as it could have been. We can pour out the contents of the test tube, and we can see a nice blue liquid comes out. In the same flask, I added more liquid ammonia and more lithium, but unfortunately I lost the footage somehow. After adding quite a bit of lithium, on the side of the round bottom flask, you see some areas look like they're copper in color. This is because at higher concentrations of the solvated electrons, it actually takes on this copper color instead of a blue. As the liquid ammonia starts to evaporate, the nice metallic color starts to disappear, and we're left with an off-white powder. As time goes on, the metallic color gets less and less, and the white powder starts to take over. Most of the white solid that you see is actually lithium amide. Unlike sodium, when lithium is added to ammonia, it very quickly forms the corresponding amide. When the ammonia evaporates, the salt will crystallize out. Some of the white powder is also formed when lithium reacts with CO2, water, and oxygen in the air. Next, I do a second run, and this time I use sodium metal. The density of sodium is actually higher than that of liquid ammonia, so this time instead of floating, it sinks to the bottom. Also, I was a little bit smarter this time, and I provide a white background so you can actually see what's going on. After most is dissolved, we're left with a blue color, but to give it that metallic bronze, we add a little bit more sodium. And just after reacting for several seconds, it starts to take on that bronze color. After letting it sit for a little bit, it might start to splash because of the heat generated by dissolving the sodium. After a little while, we're left with a bunch of off-white powder in the test tube. I scraped everything off the side, and we're left with some off-white loose powder. When it's placed on a piece of paper, it starts to bubble and heat up. This is likely due to both sodium amide and a little bit of sodium metal reacting with the air. When dumped into water, there's a little bit of a reaction between the sodium amide and alkali metal that might still be present. In our round bottom from earlier, we can pour in some water and see what happens to the metallic color. As the water gets closer to the metallic looking stuff, it converts to the white solid and then dissolves into the water. So what we're seeing is the metallic alkali metal react with water to form the corresponding white hydroxide. This hydroxide, then being water soluble, simply dissolves into the water. Just as a final example, I'll show a clip from a future video on the birch reduction. In the flask is some benzene, ethanol, and liquid ammonia, and I just put in a little bit of lithium. As the lithium dissolves, it becomes a nice blue color, and it eventually gets so dark that it almost turns black. In this reaction, benzene is being reduced, which means it's gaining electrons, and these electrons are going to come from the lithium. After a few moments, it will peak in its darkness, and it will slowly start to lighten up. This is a very good indication that our reduction is occurring. As I said before, the blue color is due to solvated electrons, and if our desired reduction is occurring, the benzene should be picking them up. Eventually, we'll get back to a totally white solution, so we add a little bit more lithium. The amount of lithium that we use in total is pre-calculated, and in the end, after the final addition, the blue color should persist, which means that all of the benzene has been reduced. Anyway, for now, that's all I have to show you about liquid ammonia, and I'll see you on the next one. Again, here's a list of the videos that I'm currently editing, and future videos I plan to film. In the videos being edited category, you can vote for the one that you want me to publish next, and in the future video category, you can vote for the one that you want me to film next.
Also, if you're feeling generous, please donate to my Patreon account because with a bigger budget per video, I can do more things. Also, just as some added information to this generic outro, I've actually gone ahead and made a YouTube fan page. When I get my act together, I should be able to set up polls there where people can vote on the next video. Anyway, that's all for now, and I'll see you on the next one.